Manuel, how's it going? I'm very good. How are you? I'm doing super, super well. Definitely it's been can't too complain. Long. I know it's been a while since we've talked, like probably a couple months. I know. Finally, we're gonna talk. We're talking again. Yeah. And in the podcast, it's so exciting. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now everyone knows what we're gonna talk about. So. <laughs> I know. It's like it's like we're being watched. All right. So, what's the gossip? Oh my god. Life's been good. <laughs> Just had Easter. <laughs> um, I'm in Germany currently, and um, I'm working like with photography. I'm also working my dad's business a little bit, and it's super fun. Yeah, you were just in Switzerland before, right? Working on your was it hospitality and tourism kind of? Yes. Yeah, so it's basically hospitality management school in Switzerland. It's mm-hmm. like just in the south where Geneva Lake is. I don't know if you know it. I've never but been, but yeah. Nice area. Everyone speaks French. <laughs> so that's kind of a bummer. But like in my school, everyone knows English. Um, it's super cool. It's so international. And Did yeah, you... like all people are really open. Everyone's really nice. That's awesome. Did you uh, did you get better at French while you were there? Uh, uh, I mean, I had French in tenth grade, which I kind of sucked at, but like, it was it was okay. Like now I'm able, like when I'm at the cashier, I'm able to communicate with them, which I'm really proud of. Yeah, that's that's good. It's almost you feel like you're fluent at that point because the only time you need to use it is in the restaurants, yeah. and then you can, and you're like, yeah, I got this. <laughs> I mean, restaurants were closed anyway, so like oh, yeah, I couldn't fair. really like go there. But yeah. like soon, I'm gonna be able to order in French. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So why don't we start by walking uh, through a little bit of the process of how you went to hospitality school? Because I know that after you graduated, you tried music for a bit, and then yeah, you did a few different things, and it and it eventually came around to um, this hospitality school where you. You got to study in Switzerland. Now you're at home and then you're going to go to Singapore. So that's pretty exciting, but it wasn't a straight line to get there. So do you want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, things that you tried before that and the obstacles um, along the way? Sure. Like, so basically, I was actually just talking with a friend about that the other day, about that whole like journey. Um, basically, what it's, I started playing the piano when I was four years old. And I've been playing piano ever since, and like music always played such a big part in our lives. We're always, my mom always put us in choirs and like opera festivals everywhere. And I mean, we had a lot of fun. Like we never played any computer games because my mom, like she said like, oh, I'll just drive you to your music lesson. So like you don't get other stupid ideas. And it was super fun growing up. And like, it always played such a big part every day. I used to practice piano, like I have my weekly piano lessons. We had the choir on Friday, on Saturday and Sunday, we had like other rehearsals, always like that. And then, but I always said also with my piano teacher, like, oh, like I love doing it, but I would never want to become a pianist. Mm. And then basically like, um, we're just like, I don't know where I'm just like always playing for fun and like learning new pieces and I loved it. And then I went to Canada in 10th grade. That's our, uh, after 10th grade and 11th grade. That's also where we met. Mm-hmm. And also like in our school, like music played such a big part. And like, again, like it, like we all like grew together with music and like, it was just like such a great community and such a wonderful school. And basically what happened after, like after I came back to Germany after two years in Canada, um, I was like, oh, like, I don't know what I'm going to do like next. Like, what's the next step, like, what am I gonna do? It was like the summer of 2018. And then mm-hmm. basically it was like, huh, what have I been doing the longest? And then I thought like, yeah, I mean, that's piano. So might as well go for the piano, even though like I always said I wouldn't want to do it like full time. Um, and then it just kind of happened. I just kind of started in like August, September to like prepare for some um, like, how do you call that again? I just forgot the word. Like an exam? <laughs> applications. When you're preparing for applications. Okay. So yeah. I first picked some school like in the US. Mm-hmm. Basically, like you also have to say that like one of my biggest dreams in like life has been to like move to New York. <laughs> Ever since I'm a little kid, I always wanted to go to New York. And um what kind of happened is I kind of used that as like a way to say, oh, like 
through the music schools, like I can end up in New York. You know what I mean? So that was mm-hmm. kind of my big inspiration. Like I want to go to New York. And so I mean, it wasn't it, it wasn't the music itself that was driving you. It was just the location and, and the music was just like a, a, a means to get there. That's what I thought. Like, that's what I saw after. But before, like, I thought like, oh, no, like, it's the music, you know. But then like after I noticed like, hey, it's actually because it was I wanted to go to New York, you know. Mm. Basically what happened, I had like three months. Deadline was December 1st to send in some videos of like me playing some recordings. I also like I actually even went there in like October to look at the schools and had like five or six schools in total where I applied to. And then like it just I don't know like in January I got the refu- I was refused from the pro from the program and like I was like okay like whatever because I kind of knew that I wasn't ready like I only practiced for three months basically for like all those pieces. And I mean, that's not enough time. And out of these three months, I went traveling to like the US to like <laughs> visit the schools, you know? <laughs> but then basically yeah. after, um, I was like, okay, like what am I gonna do next? And I like looked it up and like for so many places, I kind of like missed the deadlines already because they're like in for London, they're like in October for like mm. France, they're like, I don't know, like, I don't know. I've just missed it, you know? Yeah. And if you really, really wanted to do it, you could have waited to the following year, but you, but probably that energy of like, cause you didn't really necessarily yes. want it. You were like, if this doesn't work now, then I'm not going to yeah. do it kind of idea. Right. Well, at the, at the time I didn't really know that I was just like, Oh no, that's what I'm going to do. Like I always said, like when people ask me like, Oh, what do you want to do? I'm like, yeah, like I'm practicing to like become a pianist, blah, blah, blah. But like I was practicing like seven hours per day and it wasn't yeah. really exhausting. And I don't know, it's just like it also kind of like changed me because I'm not the kind of person to be alone all day. Like even though I like being alone, sometimes like I always want to be surrounded by people and talk with people and have like human contact. And I just didn't really have that at the time. Mm. And then basically it's like um, my mom, she found that school in like the Netherlands in Amsterdam. And she also found other schools from like, yeah, like, I would kind of want to go like to Amsterdam, maybe like I could maybe imagine that. So I kind of had only like, I kind of like, I didn't even really want to apply to a lot of schools, just like one, you know, because like for every school I had a different excuse, you know, and Germany didn't want to really go to anyways. <laughs> so then it's like, okay, like it, well, it's going to be Amsterdam. So then like in January, I went there with my dad to the open day. It was like super fun. It was like a cool location, cool school. And like, we also like went to like these master class. People performed, it was really fun. Mm. That was like January, 2019. So I've been practicing for about like four or five months or something um, at the time. And then I was like, okay, like there, you don't have to send them videos beforehand. You can just go there in April to apply directly, you know? And this was after you had been rejected from the other schools that you were going to see this? Okay. I'm like, okay, this is going to be like my only chance kind of thing. It's the second shot at it. Yes, basically. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be prepared. So like, again, like I kept practicing and practicing and practicing like every day, like seven hours, you know, and like maybe once a week I would take like a day off which like I also practiced, you know what I mean? Or yeah. I would like review the whole like repertoire. It was like, it was yeah. crazy, you know? The like, day off was I, just like, a regular person's amount of practice, right? <laughs> yeah. Basically, but yeah. then like, kind of the, if they're like really ambitious about music on a regular day, you know, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so like I had a huge program with like 45 or 50 minutes. Well, basically it was April and like I flew there again and I, I also said, like, I don't want anyone to come with me. I'm going to do it alone, you know? So I went and I kind of, like, mentally and stuff, you know? And then the big, the big audition comes, you know? Like, I'm like, okay, like, it's going to happen. What's going to happen, you know? Um, I go in and then they first, like, oh, like, what piece? You can choose the piece you want to start with. I had, like, six pieces, so five or six pieces. Mm-hmm. So, like, okay, I think I chose, like, the Bach even though like Bach is not my like, my, it was my strength piece, but I knew like, oh, like, this is like maybe kind of like a good way to get started, which mm. now looking back, I think it was actually a bad decision to start with that one. I should have started with the one I knew the best, but I thought like, oh, they're gonna ask about that later. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of dumb, but I mean, now I know. But so it's all those like, things, you're always playing games in those kind of audition type situations, right? No matter what you're auditioning for or applying for, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. if I show them all my cards right away, then it's, I don't know. It, it, even though it's the smartest thing to do, is always just to be like, here's all the stuff I can do. Cause, but it, you're tempted to start off with something you're decent at and then they won't expect right. it and you'll hit them with a good one. <laughs> yeah exactly but i think also like now looking back like it would have been smart to start with the best thing first because auditions are short they're like 10 to 15 minutes you know mm. so like after like a one or two minutes they like interrupted me and they're like okay that's good like next piece and then like I, they said like now they're gonna choose so they chose like the show upon etude so i started it's like it's like really fast yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically like i played that and then they also like in trouble again i think they wanted me to play like a third piece no i think it might only been have been these no the third piece they wanted as well so like actually the piece i knew best they didn't even want to hear it you know um, so that was kind of like yeah whatever i mean sad <laughs> because i practiced so much for it yeah but then at the time, I was like yeah whatever and then they're like okay like go out they're gonna talk you know and then mm. they walk in, I walk in again, and then they're like, yeah, um, it was already like really good, blah, blah, blah. But um, we're sorry to tell you that like, you should like try again next year. Like there's just some basic techniques you're like lacking because that's also one of the things like, I never really wanted to practice technique. I always want to play pieces because I always said, I don't want to become a pianist. It you was know, just so for never... fun. Yeah, so I, I was never so keen on like, getting that perfect technique, you know, like, I just like, oh, yeah. And then they're like, yeah, that's what you're lacking. Like, you know, you have to keep, if you keep practicing like that, like next year, you're going to have a good chance. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, like, thank you. And like walking out, I was just like, holy, I was just, I, it just like all of a sudden felt kind of free, you know, really, because the thing was like, mm -hmm. what happened during all like those months and months of practicing, I kind of lost the passion for it. Mm. I remember like I was like talking with my sister one day we're like celebrating my grand grandpa's birthday and then like we had to drive back early to uh so I could keep practicing you know and then like Becky like you know like please don't tell our parents but um I mean they're super supportive and everything but like please don't tell them like but sometimes I really hope I'm not going to get accepted because I don't know. I just like, I don't really know if I want to keep doing this till the end of my life, you know? Mm. And then like, I kind of walk out and it's just like, oh, like, I don't know. It just felt kind of freeing, you know, because I'm like, I, I'm like kind of free now. I, I don't have to keep doing this anymore because what happened like from being like my biggest passion became like a chore, you know? Mm. Yeah. And, and, when, and when it's... Like, it yeah. wasn't really fun anymore. And like, for instance, like, I don't like Mozart. I don't like Bach. I don't like these, I don't like them, you know, I don't like their music. And then like, I, I had to play it and it's hard for me. Like, I like to play cool things. You know, I like to play like something that's like impressive or like something like that sounds cool. But like, I, I don't really like listening to them. I don't like playing them. And I don't really like the music. So like, it's really hard. And I mean, that is such a big part, you know, like Mozart, Bach, they're like all like, they're kind of like building, building blocks in order for you to become like successful, you know, and like being a pianist. And you're probably competing then, with just like, so I, many people, right? Like when you, when you go to like, do these auditions so and everyone's practicing 10 hours a day. So it's just, yeah. It's and like I also remember like there are people from our school, our high school, since grade 10, they've been like practicing in order so they can like become a pianist and get into those conservatories because it's so hard, it's so competitive. Like it's crazy. And then like for me, like I just started kind of like eight months before, you know? Mm. Like, I mean, for 15, 16 years, I was like always playing and playing, or like 14 years at the time. But like I was like playing for fun but never like it was about the technique or any of that thing and then basically like um it just it I was like like my parents they were kind of like my mom was really sad my dad he's like oh like 
I'm kind of mad. Like, I don't know if you want to like study something else, you just apply and you get in, like you practice so much and then like you don't get in, you know, like why not? But I was kind of like, inside I was kind of like really happy because I knew like, I don't have to keep doing this for so long. And you know what's funny? That day I met like um, my cousin because she lives close to Amsterdam. And like, we kind of hung out, you know, mm, for like two more days or something. Mm-hmm. And then we're just like walking around Amsterdam and I walk, we walked into this store where they sell like everything. They sell like mugs, books, like phone cases, you know, these stores, those like cool stores, yeah. cactuses, you know, like <laughs> we went in there and I walked to that table with the books and I take like one book and I open it on a random page, you know? And then like, it says like fail faster. And it basically talks like, who remembers like uh, blah, 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 something Steve Jobs invented, you know, it says like, no one, he had, what he did, like what you have to do is if you fail, the secret is to get up fast and fail fast and keep going, you know, Mm. it's basically talking about all these products that were invented by famous people and no one ever saw because they were flop. But then instead of like um, being dreadful about that was a flop, they like kept going and like just got up straight away and tried again with a new product. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I thought I think, like that was, like, it really hit me. I think too that um failing is like the best way to learn too a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know. It's really good to succeed and you can learn a lot from your successes, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of times it's only when you fail that you realize either like in your case you didn't really like it or that it wasn't the right thing for you and yeah. also you can then move on to something better that is more true to who you are as a person right exactly and you know the thing was like so many people said like oh like you lost so much time like doing this and like you lost so much time to this like you almost lost a year but like no I did not lose anything like if anything I gained so much like experience I like found out so much about myself like practicing like so long every day you know it was it's just, I mean, I don't think I could do it again, but it was, it was just like such like a growing experience. And just like, I figured like so many things out during that time. And it was really, really amazing. And then basically after um, I was kind of like stuck because I'm like, you know, like, what am I going to do? And then basically like, I was like thinking about all these things because like I just kind of like failed at something I've been doing for almost a year now, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, what do I do? And then basically like I was talking like with a bunch of people about what I could do. And, you know, I was already kind of like starting with photography at the time because my dad, like he tried to push me into something. So at least I'm doing something, you know? So he's like, yeah, like you can like try to like, because they do like hotel furniture have like showrooms they're like oh try taking photos of the like showrooms because like I got a camera the summer before so like just like try taking taking pictures there and like see like like how that's going maybe you know I was like okay like I kind of started it was really fun and then I kept talking with people and talking with people and then all of a sudden my aunt says like hey like um you could become like I don't know like they're all saying like I you could become like a designer you could become an architect you could become like you know all these things but then like one time I remembered like oh my god like since ever since I'm a young kid I was saying whenever people ask me what do you want to be I said I want to be a hotel owner you know for years I've said that up until like grade nine or ten I even with my best friend like at the time like we made a contract was like grade eight that like if I'm gonna be like uh a hotel owner I will have to hire her as my manager (laughs) so like I don't know it was like hotel always played such a big part you know um she doesn't want to become a manager anymore but like now now I want to become a hotel owner again you know (laughs) so it's cool like how it all kind of returned and then like within a week like I met like three people that like studied like hotel management or like hospitality management and they're all like yeah oh my god this will be like so cool for you like you have so many possibilities like the one guy he's like working in some island i think the Car- caribbean island or something it's like our neighbor's son and then we also like we met two people in spain like 
they actually went to like a hospitality school and like they did like the coolest things i'm like oh my god like i'm gonna do that you know like mm. i never knew you could like even study hotel and i'm like hey that's so cool and it's like it involves all the things i'm like so passionate about like you can go travel you can like talk with people you can like i don't know like make events you know like it's really interesting that like that was like kind of the journey that led me there yeah it's really interesting that you mm-hmm. I was just saying, it's really interesting that you mentioned how as soon as you started listening to yourself and trying to do something that you were interested, it, it seems like in the beginning when you were doing the piano thing, it was kind of because of the prestige, right? Because it looks great and you've been playing for a long time and everyone says you'll be really good at it and it's super competitive, right? Uh, but it's like as soon as you started listening to like what what do I always like doing since I was young and what did I always want to be? It's weird how you met like three mm-hmm. people right away. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you find that that kind of stuff happens a lot in your life where it's like when you're listening to like your conscience and like really doing what you want that things kind of fall into place a little bit better? I think they do, but I also think one of the really important things with that is like you have to go through life with open eyes. And then like, if you're like searching for something, I think you're like gonna find, you know? And like, Mm. often it takes really long. And like, in my case, it took like one and a half years or something uh, to like figure out like, oh, like that's actually like the journey I wanna go. And I really wanna go and I'm passionate about. But I mean, that takes like walking through like so many like doors and like figuring out like, oh, that was the wrong way or like, you know what I mean? So that's Mm -hmm. like really interesting to me. Yeah. yeah and also cool. one thing is like after I was rejected in December from like the schools in the US, I mean, I wasn't as passionate anymore, but I still like kept going because I'm like, okay, I already started, like might as well finish it, you know? But just even the audition, that's just the beginning of it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then absolutely. it officially starts and then it's gonna be crazier. You're gonna practice like nine hours or something. Like it's it's insane. Do you think that it's a like good... a full time job? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that it's a good thing? How kind of competitive it's become? Because I feel like it kind of stifles the creativity and the aspect of, you know, really expressing yourself when things become too commercial and too competitive, to the extent of like, so like a lot of people competing for very few positions at these prestigious institutes, you know? I guess it's the way that mm-hmm. classical music world works, but it just seems like, I don't know. I don't think it's a good for people's mental health and stuff. What, what do you think about that? I think it is really, really, really tough because I mean, like everyone is like, every one of the people that studies there, like that wants to become a pianist, like they're all amazing, you know? Mm. But then also like there is, first of all, there is only a few that are going to like, really like become like concert pianist and like play so many like concerts play like concertos everything um there is only like a handful for like people to like do that and then also I think that definitely creates like a lot of pressure and I don't think that's easy at all because you know like if you you want to do something artistic but then there's so much pressure behind it I think like as you say I think that makes it way harder because mm. like then all of a sudden like it's I think it becomes less about about the like art kind of thing about the creativity and it becomes like the I don't know you have to get it right like you ha- it has to be like this 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 or else it's not good and I yeah. think that in the long term it can be really really tough mm. so, yeah yeah I, I don't know. know I think it yeah I'm glad I'm not doing it. And you know, also funny after I like, after I changed piano teacher, because I'm like, I had one more year until I would start school um, in Switzerland. And then like, um, he said like, he thought like, oh, I'm co- coming to him t- to like uh, prepare for auditions. I'm like, no, like I already did that. And he's like, okay, like, had you said you want to apply for like uh, conservatories? He's like, I would have given you a one hour talk. Why not to do it? And then if you still want to do it, then it means like you're made for it, you know? But you know, you have to, this is what like so many people said afterwards, like in order to become like a pianist or like someone like that classical musician or also musician in general, like 
if you have to pay your own bills, like if you're like, you know, account, you're reliable for yourself, you know, and for that, you have to have such a big passion that has to be the only thing you want to do. And then like, it's the absolute right thing. If you cannot imagine you doing anything else, like go for it. But then unless it's like that, like don't. <laughs> It's interesting that you say that because I've heard the exact same argument used for medical school or people who are doctors yeah. or, or, you know, in that profession, um, because I initially wanted to go to medical school. That was my kind of thing, similar to your journey when mm -hmm. I graduated. And a lot of people said the same thing, um, which I didn't hear about till after I'd done a couple of years of, of my undergrad studies. But it really hit me that that is such a good way to think about things like People should tell you all the reasons not to. And if you still want to do it, then you're probably made for it. Because some people probably love the practicing 10 hours a day and competing for the, you know, the few positions. It's the yeah. same if you wanted to be an actor, you know, in Hollywood, there's not that many positions and you might have to go 10 years of just trying before you get something, you know, mm -hmm. totally. so you have to love it to assert like a really, really high degree. Do you so want to I just... Hmm? I was just going to say, do you want to just continue um, talking a bit about uh, what you, how you moved into the, the school at Switzerland? Like how I got there, like last September. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It was really like, I packed my suitcases and I went. <laughs> no, I mean, like, did you have to, was it an application type thing that you had to do? Or was it just, you just went there right away? no oh no 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 not like that so basically what happened like of course you had to apply um i basically like i don't know i had to write some essays i had some like interviews and stuff i even had to go there for like an in-person interview mm. um which i actually thought i failed it <laughs> oh no but then actually it turned out being fine because it was like there was the one student and he was really nice and there's one teacher so like two people interviewing you and the teachers, he's just like sitting there, like, like looking at me like this, like not smiling, not like just like looking like with a straight face at me, and just like, and then like and just like looking at me like from head to like I don't know, he's like just looking at me all the time, and I was just, I got so freaked out. And then like, uh, like I don't know, just a few times he like asked like some question, like, what's your view on like this and this and hospitality. Like what are the trends in the hospitality? And then I'm like, uh, and I always try to make him laugh, but then I thought like that's my mistake, you know? I thought like oh shit, like I'm fail, like I came across so stupid, but then like I don't know, it ended up working out. I was like so happy, and then I was actually like I was like jumping, and I was so excited, and you're like yeah, like, I can go there, you know? It's it's gonna be so cool, and then now actually like. Then I went there and then they said like, oh, actually, we're going to open up a campus in Singapore um, where people can go like starting in September. So, cool. so I was like, oh, my God, that sounds amazing. Because the first year, it's kind of like a preparatory year. And like the first half, it's on school. It's like, um, it's how do you say like the first half, it's like all practical, you know, all practical workshops. And then the second half is like the internship where you like work in service and hotel, like all these things and like so now I'm doing it here in Germany but like so many people went to so many cool places you know like Dubai anywhere basically you know uh, but it's still really hard to find something with the current situation mm. so I decided to just come here because in September I'm gonna go to Singapore anyways You'll so like I'm experience. super happy with that decision yes so I mean I've never been to Singapore have you no you gotta come visit me. <laughs> I'm so down. But I heard from people that went. It, it, that is really cool place and like really exciting, like really like I don't know, amazing like locations, restaurants, everything. So futuristic. That's what I heard. Yeah, like that. The three buildings with the cruise ship on the top of it, and then yeah, like the that's good. Those are cool. Apparently, that's a hotel. I heard. <laughs> yeah, that's you gotta go. It's ridiculous. I mean. It's such an interesting history too, like how the how the city or well, the country, but it's basically just a city that became a, its own country came to be where it's just, you know, in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> and it's so much so much wealth and so much um diversity. And it's like such an interesting city.
Mm -hmm. I just heard that it gets really, really hot. It gets like 30 or 35 and it's really humid. So I think I definitely have to get used to that. <laughs> but yeah. I think other than that, it's going to be really cool. It'll be a little hotter than Switzerland for sure. But um, but I'm sure that you'll oh, be definitely. Especially yeah. like the school's kind of like a mountain. So it's freezing cold. <laughs> in the winter, at least, you know, I've only been there like in the fall to winter. So in the winter, God, like we had so much, which it was really nice. There's so much snow and like behind school, there is a big forest and like all the kids are like sledding down and it's so cool. And like also like looking up, but then like you always got to walk from like the like dorms where you live to the school, which is like, I mean, it's a five minute walk. But I mean, walk there in like business clothing with business shoes and it, like freezing cold. Those five minutes seemed like forever. Like I was running most of the time, so it only takes two or three minutes. So I don't have to be in the cold with my suit. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it'll be the exact opposite in, in uh, Singapore. It'll just be like sweltering hot. You'll be running so you get into the air conditioned place I and i still gotta wear the suit which that i'm really unconcerned about because i think it's gonna be so hot and if you're not used to it i think oh my god that's gonna kill me <laughs> so is it like suit and tie everywhere because it's like formal business situation yeah uh, the dress code is really strict um we have to wear i don't know there's like a 14 page <laughs> booklet on the, on the dress code and what you're allowed to wear and what you're not allowed to wear and what the certain rules are and there's even dress code ambassador that guy he's kind of like an icon at the school he like walks <laughs> around with his ipad and he controls people for the dress code and if he finds out like that something's wrong like you're gonna get in trouble and you have like detention <laughs> and then you're actually gonna have to help him tell students on their like tell them on their dress code so people get called out and like oh. and like punished yeah. because they didn't wear the right and if you're doing something bad you gotta go with monsieur Laurent <laughs> and you gotta like call people like on the dress code so it's definitely not something i want to do <laughs> many people had to do it they said it's not as bad as it sounds but yeah. You make it like, sound like uh, the internal politics I, like, there are just absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it's crazy. Like whenever I see him, I, I run. Like I get scared. <laughs> like, I'm like, is everything okay? Is my tie? Especially in the first day of school, I was there with my suit and my tie, right? And then like he walks up to me and he was like speaking like French, like me too. I was like, oh my god, like I, I'm not understanding what you're saying. I got so scared. He's like, oh, like. Uh, like your your tie is like not tight enough right he's like oh like you gotta do like like this you know he's like <laughs> almost like <laughs> snangling me to death <laughs> but like yeah it's like after that I knew like okay he said like it's fine it's the first day of school like I don't blame you but then like after like I was like okay like I always gotta like make it really tight but I you know actually one tip I just learned it after a while you're okay. allowed to wear turtleneck and no tie. So I kept wearing turtlenecks nonstop because first of all, that's faster. Second of all, it's so much more comfortable. And like, I also think like it looks better, but I mean, that's preference. Yeah, definitely. And it's, and, and the conventional look is probably more so just because of the professionalism aspect, right? If you're gonna be running a hotel, um, it's like, you know, you wanna, you wanna have a degree of professionalism, but it's not like a fashion statement necessarily. <laughs> but still, like everyone tries to like make it their own, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's like everyone has to, we have like these strict guidelines on like what the dress, dress code has to be, but like people try to like push it in like their own way. So like it, everyone kind of has their own, like, you know what I mean? Like their yeah. own, own like style in a way. So I think that's really cool yeah but yeah definitely like i think it's also like a good way to like be prepared for the future because they also like i don't know there's like their values that are like really strict you know like you always have to be on time and like be early you know like if you're more more than like a few minutes late like you're gonna be kicked out of for the day you know like it's really strict but i also think it's a good training because like if you're like in that mentality where everyone's always on time, everyone's always well-dressed, you know, like 
I think that like kind of like creates an environment where like you can, I don't know, you just adapt to that, you know? Yeah. And no matter what you're doing in your life, you're going to have um, like reliability and, and, and people can trust you and know that you're going to make sure, like, if you say, I'm going to be there at this time, I'm going to be there. And if I say that this is going to happen, I feel like that kind of attitude goes a long way if you're in a, in business, right? Totally. But you know, what's so funny. Like usually like whenever I'll go somewhere, I'm like five to 10 minutes late, you know, <laughs> basically like when I'm in Switzerland, like it's like it something starts at like, let's say eight and I'm there at like uh, seven to fifty eight. I'm like, oh no, we're late. Like <laughs> we have to run, you know, it's just <laughs> like, I don't know, like even if it's like earlier, I already say I'm late, you know, so yeah. like it's totally different mindset. So like now and like whenever I'm like one or two minutes late, I'm like, oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, that's totally silly if you think about it, you know? Yeah. Is it like, really that, like sticks with you. Is it like that in your personal life too now where you're like, you've become more mm -hmm. punctual? I think so. I mean, like I'm not meeting that many people right now anyways, but like if I were, I would probably be more punctual. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you can't really test it out with everything being shut down the way that it is yeah. right now. <laughs> but like, also like at this point, like I'm so like sick with like all the rules. So like, I don't know. I think like that's also one thing I learned actually from my cousin, like, you know, and I like, you know, when everything started, like from like March till September, every single day, I, there's like this kind of like news show. They have like this 15 minute like news show of like what happened during the day, you know? every day at 8 15 mm. uh, no at 8 so basically I always like watched it every day like on my phone like I would watch and then look for the news and like it always made me so like annoyed and just like like depressed and sad I'm like oh like like all the rules all this and this and then like um, I was talking with my other cousin which is his twin sister and she said like yeah she's kind of like admiring him because like he first of all said like 2020 for him was the best year in his life because it was so chill and he got to do so many cool things. You know, it's like, it was all like, so he, for him, it was, I mean, he didn't have to struggle about like financial stuff, like about these things, you know, many people had to struggle with, mm -hmm. like he just always did his thing. He not one single time watched the news, never. He just like, when there was news, like everyone talked about it anyway. So he knew it, you know, like never watched the news. Like he just like, He's just like living his life and taking it the way it comes. Mm. And I was like, wow, that's actually so cool. And I really admired him. Like, why am I like always watching the news? Like, it always makes me sad. Like, it always drags me down. Like, if I'm not doing it, like, if there's something new, everyone's going to talk about it anyways, you know? So I really like that really changed. And like, I'm, I feel so much better now. Like, also, everyone's always like talking about it. And I think like, not talking like I don't know not talking about it, it just makes you happier I mean now we're talking about it but like in like day-to-day -day life you know yeah I think also the thing is if you remember that what the news is going to be presenting is like the one percent that's most big and that it's like super biased to the negative side of things and it's not like a realistic representation of everything like it seems like when you're watching the news at least on tv or something it seems like it's everything like the world's so scary and all this stuff's happening but uh when you look at the data or if you just read it it's a lot easier to interpret it with your own uh perspective and see like oh yeah some things are bad but other things are good you know because the news will only show you that this terrorist bombing happened and that there's you know covid and this and that but it will never tell you like hey, this guy started this project that saved millions of people. It never says anything about that kind of stuff. Yeah, totally. And I think like, I don't know, like you're bombarded with bad news every single day. And like, you know, are you really missing out? Like if you're not hearing about it, I mean, like, of course it's good to be informed and everything, but like, yeah. I think like it's so much more important to surround yourself with like positivity and like good news, you know, and like, just like positive things and like I don't know like if there is like not that many positive things like trying to like look for these things you know I think that yeah. really like helps a lot like an optimistic viewpoint for sure but I also think that um yes. that um 
you know, like the being informed thing is kind of a misnomer because like I said, and like you said too, the news is so biased that it's not like people are so that would say, you know, you need to watch the news to be informed. It's like, no, if you watch the news, you become indoctrinated with like one specific viewpoint. You don't become informed. The only way you truly become informed is by reading like really, really unbiased news that's really flat and will just show you the facts and then coming up with your own interpretation. But it's really hard to do that if you're watching a person who already has their own perspective talk about it on TV. Totally. And they try to make it unbiased, but like, no, it's always biased, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, like if their their intention is to like, I don't know, make people scared so they're going to stay home, like, of course, they're going to like make everything seem like worse, like maybe than it is, you know, maybe it's also like really bad, but like, that's what they try to do. And like, they try to influence people in some way, you know, and like, I think it's like kind of good to stay out of that. <laughs> yeah, I think what your cousin did too is something that I've started trying to do as well um and for similar reasons like there's just some you know you always meet some people who they just have it's everything they seem to be lucky everything seems to go you know well and they just seem it's because of their attitude a lot of times and i was like i was like oh i'm spending so much time on watching the news or going on to social media and i was like what if i just change that and spend time with my family or doing other things and it totally changes how you think about everything you know you know, like also this year I started before, like, you know, how so many people are so addicted on their Instagrams and like, are like, I don't know, like everyone has that platform now for many people. It's TikTok. Like I never got into TikTok. I like, <laughs> I don't even have it, <laughs> which I feel kind of feel bad about. But I mean, I actually have it, but I never go on it. Like I have an account, but I, I think like, I don't know, like I'm never on TikTok, like never. Yeah. And I'm not on Snapchat. Like actually youtube i deleted it from my phone today um but then instagram like i try to like keep it down you know what i mean because like in the beginning of the year i thought like hey like what are things like i can do like so i'm not so much on my phone and i there i said like the screen time for like 30 minutes and for like three or four months now i've been like only like 30 minutes on instagram you know every day which i mean it it could still be a lot, but compared to other people, like, I feel really good about myself because like, you know what, like, what are you really doing there? You know, it's like, of course, everyone's like, oh, like I used it to like connect with so many people, you know, but like at the end of the day, like everyone just spends time on the explore page, you know, like, like yeah. not many people like really communicate on there. You know? It's just like you post some stories, some posts maybe, but then most of the time you're going to be on the explore page, you know, and everyone has these straps where like you're lying in bed and then like it says like oh oh just going on instagram for like two minutes ends up being half an hour you know and, like yeah. so i really actively try to stop that and, like, just like you know like no instagram like before bed anymore like just like half an hour max you know and yeah that also really like changed my life in a way mm. yeah i think in terms of productivity and in terms of like your psychology, especially before you go to sleep, or if it's the first thing you see when you wake up, it, it totally puts like a, a, a lens on your, uh, on your entire day and how you look at everything. Um, yeah. And I, and even what you're saying, like limiting it at 30 minutes. Yeah. I mean, even just comparing to yourself before, right. If you're doing better, that's so much better. And I also think there's a lot more productive ways to communicate with people. Like, I think WhatsApp or text is just a lot better because then you're only messaging yeah. someone directly. Like, if I go onto it, the only thing I'm going to use it for is talking to someone. Whereas Instagram, as you mentioned, it has the explore feed. You can get distracted. And we know how the, like, the brain works in terms of the dopaminergic pathway. You're, you're just going to get hooked on it. It's like a drug, you know? It's kind of dangerous if you do it too much. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's designed in a way for you to be addicted to it, you know? So yeah. I think it's, like, good to kind of, like, resist that. Because, like, I don't know, for myself, and I think for, like, a lot of other people, too, like, I don't know, when, whenever you have, like, these, like, short moments during the day where you're, like, free, you don't have anything to do, first thing you do is go on Instagram, you know? Like, mm. also for me, like, I used to do that, like, so much. But then it's also, like, for what, like, I have like a few few minutes now I can like I'd rather use it for myself 
than just like spend it on Instagram. Like, because at the end of the day, there is nothing like important happening anyway. Same with the news, you know, like it's the same thing over and over again. Like, am I gonna like grow from it? No, like, <laughs> so like might as well like not do it. Yeah, and I think like if you do want to get your news, like just finding like a written thing can be really good too. Like, you know, you can subscribe to like BBC or something and like the main things. I'll be like, oh, this is happening with the COVID thing. You read it. Okay, great. I'm done. You know, instead of getting distracted, because it's so easy to get distracted. And I think we all tell ourselves, oh, I'm not going to get distracted. And then we do. But then we say, oh, like what? Just next time I won't. But we don't address like the root problem, you know? And that can be bad. And you know what? Yeah, you know what? I also realized like one thing. I just realized that recently, like so many times, like I feel myself like I should do something. Like, I don't know if it's like something for work, something for school, anything, you know? And then basically what's happening, it's like, um, I know I have to do something, but then what I used to do is like, I used to take, oh, I got to get informed. I got to do this and this. I got to watch the news as like an excuse for like, oh, I'm being pro productive to like watch the news. But actually like, it's like a kind of thing to like, not to procrastinate, you know, yeah. to not doing things like, but then for me myself, I'm thinking like, oh, I'm like so productive because like, I'm finding out all those news, which is just like a way to get distracted, you know, like. I think we often like use these things as like a way to procrastinate things we actually should do. Like we know we should do, but then we're like, no, like it's, it's so important. Like we make those excuses, like it's so important to be informed. It's so important to be this and that, you know? And I think that's totally silly. And then you also get um, like less good at using your time effectively when you are working on something. Cause, cause when you set aside an hour to work on your school, or your work, then you just you work for 20 minutes, and then go on Instagram for five, and then you work for 20. And then, you know, and that might be like the Pomodoro technique is like, it's good to only work for a little bit and then take a break. But it's just not an not an effective break, because then your mind just gets even more worked up. And I think it's it's just like a self. It's like a totally. positive feedback loop, you know, you keep doing more and more. Yeah, and also like these things are like, I, I don't know, like, I feel like more and more I see, like, so many of these things are so irrelevant, you know, like, even if you watch, like, on YouTube, like, these, like, information videos on, like, I don't know, like, what happens if the earth is really flat, I don't know, like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, like, the fact. The, the these, real, like, stupid the real videos way. where you think, like, oh, you're learning so much, yeah, like, you're learning so much about science, but, like, I don't know, it's just, like, actually, it's all, like, entertainment, but, like, stupid entertainment, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah i mean sometimes i think learning about science is better than like i don't know i think if you're gonna just learn about something it's good to watch like a science youtube video rather than watching just like some stupid thing that has no value but i agree that a lot of times those science ones are just like this engineer guy who's like i'm building this like thing that shoots a baseball faster than the speed of sound it's like that's cool but how's that going to help me in my day-to-day -day life you know <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah. it's just like i don't know i found like these things are getting like so like irrelevant mm -hmm. and also i think it's it's hurting interpersonal know. connections because we don't take the time to get to know people before we like social media lowers the barrier of getting angry it lowers the barrier of you know just all these sort of extreme emotions like getting super invested getting super happy getting super angry like and it's not it's not good i think because normally you and i would talk and then if we had a disagreement we would just you know continue to talk and figure out what it is or whatever uh but with social media and the news and stuff i think it can just get to the point where you become so ingrained in one way of thinking that you don't even listen to people who have another perspective than you. And like, that's really dangerous. The only way that we learn in life is by being open to people with exactly the opposite perspectives to us. We might not like them as people, but we should still 
listen to what they say and then try to prove through a, a good argument why they're wrong rather than just yelling at them, right? I mean, that's also one thing like with the algorithms on like these social media platforms, like if you have an opinion on something, like let's say like you are really like pro-Trump, then like you're going to see all these things that speak for Trump. But then if you're like pro, like, I don't know, like Biden or something, you're going to see like people like post about like democracy, about like good, like the, the parties, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like you're going to see people supporting him, but then like, I think it always like they know what, what you're interested in, what like you want to see. And then like they promote that to you because of course that keeps you longer on their platform. Yeah. And it's confirmation bias. Like you can find really ridiculous things that you think and then find an algorithm that will systematically or systemically show you, no, systematically <laughs> show you um, results that agree with what you're saying. You know, you can find like even for flat earth theorists, as you mentioned earlier, it, the way that it works is if you really truly believe that you can find enough conspiracy theories to make you a re any reasonable person who only got that as their input to think this must be true you know it's crazy yeah it's so like it's crazy and then like i also think like you get like manipulated by these platforms like without even knowing it mm. yeah yeah i think it's so good to just sometimes get take a breath of fresh air and it's super cool that we live in this globalized world or I can like talk with you halfway across the world and there's so many good things, but it's also nice to just live kind of simple truths as well mm -hmm. and just, you know, go for a walk and, and like, Hey, I live in the world. I'm alive. That's crazy. Like those little things, appreciating them. When I was talking with Izzy mentioned this in our podcast and it's the same thing. It's just, um, like appreciating these small things i think it's so cool yeah like yeah as, you, as we said earlier like focus on the like gut things you know focus on things that like i don't know the positivity of things you know like focus on like i don't know things we can be grateful for mm. like rather than like get, getting distracted by like all these negativity like that's around us all the time anyways like it can also be people you know like we don't have to be with people that constantly like drag us down tell us about all the negative things you know like like if like i don't know i feel like in order to be optimistic like you have to also surround yourself with people like that are optimistic and then like turn off like all those i don't know like news all those channels you know that and just like see like the good things in life you know yeah because you're always going to be able to find bad things so you kind of have to focus on <laughs> on the good things and don't ignore the bad things but like I don't think it's helpful to just point out bad things basically ever. I think that's basically just something no one should ever do. I mean, we should point out bad things, but never just point them out. Never just say like, that's <laughs> terrible. And then stop. What did you do? Like, if, if it's terrible, suggest an option for how we can, you know, make it less terrible. And let's start working towards that kind of idea. You that's know, so right. That's so right. Yeah. So we've talked so much about um, your hospitality. Uh, we've talked about kind of finding more of those moments in life through avoiding some news and social media. Um, you traveled a lot over the past couple of years, and I'm sure yeah. that there were some crazy stories and some really, really important lessons that you got uh, just through meeting different people and going to different places. Do you want to just talk a bit about your travels, maybe starting from after you graduated and uh, and then just maybe we'll go from there? Wait, sorry, I, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I just said we'll start with your travels and oh, the Internet. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So basically, um, I don't know, ever since I'm a little kid up and like traveling and traveling and traveling, like it's always like especially my mom, like a big priority she had is like to go to different places. Like first, like, I don't know, like 11, 12 years, like we always stay within Europe and like we went to Greece, to Italy, to Spain, to France, to like everywhere basically. And then once I was 12, I think I was 12. The first time we went, it was North America. 
and I mean that already was like such a different world you know to the one like um like me and family were used to like we went to like the east coast we went to New York we went to Florida and I don't know it was such a fun trip you know and then like I think two years later we went again and I think like the more I traveled and also the older I got like the more I saw like hey like there's different ways how people live their lives and that was always like kind of really interesting like in 10th grade I remember we went with my school to Shanghai in China and mm -hmm. it was so crazy because like I mean, at the time I've been like to many places within Europe, I've been to North America, but like I've never been like to the Asian like countries, you know, any Asian country. And then like we went there and I mean, also at the time, like I wasn't as open and have more stereotypes, you know, and like now looking back, I see that more. And I was also kind of like, maybe like, I don't know, like confused, like why did they do this and that? Because I mean, like even like European and like North American culture, they're kind of similar, you know, but then like, if you look, compare like, co like European or American culture to Asian culture, it's so different. It's like nothing like we're used to here. And then mm -hmm. I think like when you go there, especially when you're young, like I think it's like such a culture shock, like to be like in an environment where it's nothing like you're used to, you know? and like even the food everything is different you know like the entertainment the food the, like language is so i mean language is different everywhere you go but like it's just like so different it's crazy you know but more and different then, with um, the language the too of, right yes totally like i don't know it was just it was such a we all kind of had a little bit of a culture shock like it, it even started with like the technology like they were like way more technologically advanced than we were and like or even like their school system, like they had so much homework. They like my, like I, we lived in families where we're like 18 people or 16, two teachers. We all lived in like kind of like homestay families and then they came to Germany after. But like, it was so interesting because like they, like we got to see their school and like they had like, their school was so tough in 10th grade compared to us. Like they had such crazy amounts of homework um like every day they used to like do homework till like 1 a.m like I'm not even exaggerating they did homework till like 1 a.m and then at seven they had to get up and that in like 10th grade I think that was like for all of us that was like so crazy we're like oh my god we want to go back to school in Germany where there's less homework you know <laughs> and then when we were in Germany we we're complaining we have so much homework I'm like no 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 like compared to that it's nothing you know we have so much freedom Mm. and that was really cool and also like seeing like all the buildings all the architecture but also like mostly how people live their lives you know mm. and I think like over the years like I've been seeing that more and more like the more you talk to people like usually when you go somewhere the people are open the people are like excited to meet people from other countries and um I think like by talking like you and also like as, as we said earlier like walking through life with open eyes mm -hmm. like and just like seeing things you know like talking with people like seeing like how how do they live their lives you know compared to us like what do they do that like they do better than us or like what do like we do or what do I do that like I think maybe it's better than like what they do you know and like I think through that like you can learn so much and you can I don't know like you can really like more like learn more about yourself like what you like like what you dislike like I don't know it's just like it's just like such a great feeling to like get to know new things or even like food wise you know like <laughs> I think like so many people they're like limited to the things they know and like I mean if I look at my grandparents like they want for breakfast they want they they're like I don't know they're like bread bun with like a cheese and a sausage and you know like that like it's like so traditional that's what they've been eating for years for decades you know but then like and like hey for even for breakfast like there's so many different options available like 
stuff I never knew existed. Like for instance, like in China, we had like kind of like a rice soup for breakfast, you know, like it was all savory. Then like, I don't know, like you go to US or Canada, people like eat egg benedict, like stuff like that stuff I've never known before. And mm. it was, I don't know, it's like, and then when you come back, you also like realize so many things like, oh my God, like I just like saw something here that was like really impressed me, like, or how people live their lives. You know, for instance, one of the things after I went to Canada or the US, like when I came back, like everyone's like so nice when you're at the cashier, like you talk with them, that's something completely normal there. Then you come back and you go to the cashier at the supermarket and it's just like silence, you know, like no one talks, people just like beep, 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 beep. And then they say like 1235 and then five, you know, like that's mm. conversation you have. And then like when you're there, like you're like, I don't know, you're talking about the most random things. And I think that's like so cool. Like some people also argue like, oh, it's like insincere. Like it's not, I don't know, it's not genuine conversation, but I'd rather have like some small talk, like, some random small talk with someone I don't know with the cashier or the bus driver and like having a good time like it makes me happier too you know wow. and just like being like oh like being in this environment where people are like more cool like more reserved you know like some people prefer that you know so they can be unbothered yeah. but then like for instance that's something I realized like, hey like I think it's so cool how people are like so much more talkative and so much like it feels like more welcoming warmer like more open you know and that definitely is something like you learn it and then like you try to like adapt it when you go back you know like and also like I don't know when like you start making a conversation with like maybe the cashier here first like they might be a little like like what's that person doing but then like later it's like you know, they're, they're also happy about it. Like when you like leave the train and you say thank you to them, they're like, oh, like no one ever says thank you to like <laughs> the yeah. person that's controlling the tickets on the train, you know? But like mm -hmm. when you say thank you to them, they're like, oh, like they're happy about it. And I think it can also make their day better, you know? And I think like everywhere you yeah. go, like you can like see new things and then like apply them to yourself. And I think that's really like, I think you always like know like when people have gotten around and like you can feel it in their energy mm. because people I th feel like they're like, often more open because they've seen more things you know so I think it's super important like if you can you travel and I mean that's also maybe one of the advantages if you're like in Europe because like you can like all the countries are connected like everything's close like you can fly to I don't know like to Brussels for 80 euros you know like that's not a lot of money like of course like it's money and you gotta be able to somehow afford that but like I feel like if you make an effort like you can travel for so cheap nowadays you know you might not stay at the nicest hotels but like you can stay at like some hostels or some Airbnbs for like cheap money you know and I think like especially when you're young that is like such an like I don't know it's such like a good way to learn and get to see the world in the different eyes or different lenses you know and the exposure that you have to different and, cultures as you as you mentioned probably helps you to just become less prejudiced towards different things and at the end of the day that's probably the best way for people to get to you know not be a discriminatory towards other people is just by seeing different people and saying hey this person's not that different from me that's really yeah. like i thought they would be but they're not we're very similar everyone's human you know that kind of idea yeah i mean like before kind of thing like what we used to do we always used to go like to uh, for like family vacations we always used to go like to hotels and they like kind of like the touristy things but also then just as you said like right now like after I went to Canada, like, and I came back, like, we started going, like, also, like, more to Airbnbs, not hotels anymore, and, like, trying to do, like, things local people do, you know, mm. like, talking with, like, I don't know, the Airbnb owners, and be like, yeah, like, do you have stuff that, let me, like, not necessarily all the tourists do, you know, and I feel like, especially by doing that, and, like, trying to, like, figure out, like, what are the places not most people go to, but, like, the people that actually live there go, and I think like that also makes it super interesting because mm -hmm. like you get to see, as you say, like everything from a totally new point of view and like you become less judgmental about things because like if you go somewhere, you're the guest, you can't be judgmental, you know, and you have to accept it the way it is. That's what I noticed when I went to Shanghai back then. It's mm -hmm. like, 
I kind of like noticed that after too, but like I'm going there, like that's how they live their lives, you know? So I have to be accepting of that because I also accept when they come to my country, I accept them to like also like, like respect that, you know? Yeah, I think, and yeah, I think I it think works. Like that really like changed a lot. Like, yeah, I think it works both ways too, right? Because there's something mm-hmm. really... I, I think there's something really uh, beautiful too about people who live in their own culture and they ha- maybe haven't gone places. Like you mentioned your grandparents kind of with their same thing for many years or people, some of the people you met in Shanghai maybe who had the same um, tr- tradition for a long time. It's really cool to have those traditions and those cultural things and to preserve them. But I think when people travel, then the people who do have those traditions, they can show the traveler their tradition. And the traveler can also show them that, you know, there's different people in different parts of the world that live differently. And so it works as a benefit for everyone, because then everyone can become less kind of judgmental, as you say, but we can also continue to have uh, cultures and we're and we don't be we don't try to put our own culture on someone else when we go there, you know, we go somewhere and we just accept that it's their culture and we try to, um, you know, be a part of that for whenever we're there. But we also give them a little bit of what we're like, you know. And also one thing, like, I don't know, uh, like, if you ever had the chance to do that. But one thing I like fell in love doing is like actually traveling somewhere alone. Like, mm. um, I think that is also like one of these things for like yourself, like, First of all, I think like, of course, like I love like going somewhere with my family or with friends or something. But then also like this one thing, like I noticed, like when I travel alone, like you can also totally be like, like adapt, like do it, do it however you want. You know, like if you want to go somewhere, you can go somewhere. If you don't want to go somewhere, you don't have to go there. And like, I also think like having your like yourself, like in your own like pace and like seeing everything like through like your lens and like, I don't know, like just like spending time like that I think that can also like really like you can reflect on yourselves and also like way more like see oh like how do I fit in in here like Mm. you know observe way more and I think that is also one of the things I start I love doing now yeah I've I've only had a couple and I can do anyone basically yeah, I've, I mean, I've only had a couple chances to go by myself different places, but I, I totally agree. And it's something that I would like to do more. And I definitely recommend as well that, you know, just Salman Rushdie said this one time, he's like a writer. He said, uh, if you mm-hmm. go somewhere with someone else, then you just bring your culture with you. But if you go somewhere by yourself, then you, you don't as, because you become like you do obviously, but you don't have another person you can just speak with in your language, right? Like if I go with three other English speakers to a place where no one speaks English, then we can just be our own little bubble within the bigger bubble. But if I go by myself, then I have to look out and see, I might not understand it, but I have to kind of appreciate what's going on in a different way. And also adapt, you know, like, and also, like, you learn so much about, like, problem sol- solving. <laughs> like, I don't know, I feel like it's, like, grade 11 math, like, where you're trying to solve a problem. But, like, it's true. Like, you gotta, you gotta, like, I don't know, like, solve problems. And, like, when, yeah. I don't know, like, sometimes you don't know how to get around. Like, you don't know how to, I don't know, how to do things. And then, like, even though, like, you have to, like, try to ask, you have to try to, like, and in the beginning, that can be really intimidating. But then, like, walking up to some stranger you don't speak their language and then try to ask them like how do I get there like I think that can really like I don't know like it really can put you out of your own comfort zone and that's definitely like what it's all about like if like you can get out of your own comfort zone and like you can be really like learn how to be independent and I think that is like so valuable Mm. I mean for the rest of the life you know like I'm like independent like not scared to ask people you're like you're able to walk up to people like also be welcoming like not seem like a creep <laughs> or something like I That's think that can good. be really like helpful yeah I, I think too <laughs> that uh that just giving yourself opportunity to um push your boundaries your own boundaries 
and whether that is in traveling or something else is just so so helpful with growing as a person you know totally like if you stay within your own little yeah, bubble I think it's just... then you never learn anything you know yes yeah that's just what i was gonna say too like i think the most important things to just like get out of your like day-to-day -day life you know just like try to find like figure out like how can i do something in a different way like look how people do it their ways and like and then like at the end of the day you can always be like oh like i agree with that or i disagree with that but then like not being judgmental towards that like i think like in the beginning that can be like a big challenge but then like accepting that that like there's different ways how people live their life and i'm also not perfect like in what i do and i think like realizing that like it really like helps you to like become way more open and like yeah yeah definitely definitely do you have any specific travel stories that happen to you that are like really memorable oh <laughs> i gotta think <laughs> um we all have not traveled in so long so like it's just like <laughs> it's hard to think about no but it's just that's true i think like for me what always like makes things really special is like when i find like places where tourists don't go mm. you know and i think like that's like i think like finding these like hidden spots like i think that is like I don't know that to me is like so fun and just like I don't know like I think just like walking through the streets and like just taking in everything it's just like the whole feel you know I think that's what's like the most impressive and like that's like one of the feelings like you could just be like Im immersed in like your whole like new surrounding mm -hmm. But like I'm, I'm trying to think, think of some specific story, but <laughs> I can't even remember right now. But see, it's because I'm put on the spot. Yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. like like five minutes, like after we hang up, five minutes later, I'm like, oh, that's what I should have said. <laughs> you should have talked about that one or that one. Yeah, I think a lot of times that's that's the case too. And and I don't know if it's the same for you, but sometimes I remember moments, but, uh, but oftentimes it's feelings that kind of stick with you and linger yeah. uh, after you go to a specific place. So you, you, you know, you have a certain sense of this was something that I experienced there because it was so different, or this was something that really challenged my way of thinking, or made me have to shift one of my paradigms and, 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 uh, you know, a new totally. schema. But those are the cool moments, I think. I mean, for me, like one of the most like memorable things is just like, like I went to New York and just like watching like the sunset and like the city is just like, I don't know, everything's getting dark, but the, like all the lights turn on. Like that to me is like such a cool feeling. I'm just like looking around like, damn, this is so impressive. Yeah. Um, also like, just as you said, like the thing like, the things you don't remember is like, oh, like I went to this like fancy restaurant or like this and that, like, that's not the stuff you remember, you know, like you're not gonna remember like your, like, I don't know, nice hotel room or something, you know, but like, it's really like those like small moments, like you remember, for instance, like last year in December, I went to London, mm. um, it was 2019. I went to London and it's just like, I was at this market and it was, it was just before Christmas, like three or four days before Christmas. And then I found this like sugar cane and be like, oh, this is like, dear stranger, this is for you. I wish you the happiest, like, uh, uh, like Christmas and like all the best or something like that. You know, it's just like, I just found this on the street and was, it was so cool. You know, like, it's just like these really small things and you're seeing like, oh, there, there is good people. There is like good things in the world, you know? I think that's just like really memorable and just like just like yeah just seeing all of that and taking all of that in yeah it's almost like somebody's speaking directly to you in those some of those moments right 
you know, or you see something and you're like, wow, this, totally. this is talking to me, even though it's in the middle of a place where I shouldn't have found it necessarily. Yeah. Super cool. Mm -hmm. All right, bro. Let's, um, so this has been a great talk so far, but let's, let's move on to the, um, the final question that I've been asking everyone. Uh, and that yes. is, yeah. And that is if you could tell one story or have one message that would get through all the noise and all of the distractions in the world and would really resonate with people and connect with them, what would that message or story be? Can you please say that one more time? Like there's just a storm started outside and the connection was really bad. Oh no. We can okay. cut that part out. <laughs> no, it's all good. I just said, um, if you could tell one message that would get through the noise and connect with people, what would that be? Oh. <laughs> That's a really good question. I think it is just like sticking like to who you are and like surrounding yourself with like people that can like make you feel good, like make you feel positivity. Like, and I think like ultimately that like just can create like a world where you can like walk around with like, I don't know, just like positive feelings and focusing on the positive things, you know, just like if you're surrounding yourself with like just good things and try to look for good things, I think that just really like can help you to just like stay like focused and just stay happy overall because that's what it's all about. Mm. Like I don't know only, if that made any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like maybe you only have one kind of life, so you, you have to try to make it like enjoy it kind of thing and and focus on yes. trying to find the good and the beautiful moments. Yes, totally. I think like, I don't know, this is just like also with everything going on. And like, I think it's so important. I feel like now more than ever. And I feel like this is all a lesson we can learn. It's just like, if you surround yourself with positivity and like, look for like positive, positive things all over the place that like you're just going to become so much happier. And I think like, yeah, I think that's what like, we all have to do. Like, be happy or also automatically gonna become like more kind, more like, um, I don't know, l less judgmental, all these things. And I think that's just like focusing on the positive things, on the good things in life. That's I think like one message we all have to keep in our heads. Yeah, and I think you have to fight against your internal cynic that tries to tell you not to do that, right? That, that that's like not the, not yes. a good message because it, at the end of the day, like you said, if you're nice to people, if you're happy or not just happy, but like if you're more positive with how you look at things, then you'll be nicer to people and you'll be less judgmental and that'll make other people feel better too. Mm -hmm. And I think like, I don't know, it even starts for me like, you know, like these days where like everyone's like you go somewhere and I feel like everything's bad. Like, I don't know if you're like, you send out positive, like if you can find like positivity somewhere, like even if like you go out and like give people a smile, like it will always come back. And I think like if you portray that, like it will always come back, you know, like it, you just attract like good things, you know? And I think like, I don't know, I think that's like a good example for it. And that's all something, even though it's not easy, but it's all something we have to focus on. Yeah, definitely. And I love that. That that's a that's a really good message. Thanks so much for hopping on the podcast. It was thank really you. great. It was really great to have you. And yeah, um, thank you for doing it. Finally, we're able to do it. I know we we planned to do it a while back. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm I glad know. that we were able to make it work eventually. There were always things going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you could have been the one of the first. Yes, man. You're still one of the first I'm guests. Sorry. There's only like I'm so sorry, people. Ben. <laughs> but it's no, okay. I'm I'm really glad it finally worked out. Like it was so fun. And I hope to do it again sometime soon. 
yeah, hopefully, maybe we'll be able to talk about uh, Singapore when you're there, or even before you go there, we can talk about some of the photography projects and stuff. So yeah, it will be great. Of course, I'm super excited. Awesome, loved it. I hope that you liked episode 11 of At the Base of the Baobab Tree featuring the one and only Manuel Schuster. Um, please join us again next time for episode 12. Have a good one.